Before coming to this earth as a man, it seems to indicate in the Bible that Jesus Christ was spirit. You see in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ came as the angel of the Lord. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says that the angels are ministering spirits. And we can see that the Father as well, according to the words of Jesus in John chapter 4, is spirit. You see, God is seeking for those to worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. That would be the Father. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, if you have like father, like son, it seems to stand true that in the youth instructor, these words can be said from, notice not throughout, but from eternity. A big difference. From eternity, there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. They were two, yet little short of being identical. Two in individuality, yet one in spirit, and heart, and character. That's from 1897, pretty late in the life of the author. So, just the other day I was reading a verse that kind of threw a spin on something I'd said earlier. And it's taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. Notice what it says. For God, that would be the Father in this context, it seems. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, was God the Father the one that was speaking in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, which says, God said, let there be light, and there was light? So if this is so, then the Son of God was represented in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 as the Spirit. So before he had divested himself of his omnipresent Spirit, of course, he was Spirit with the omnipresence. That would be Christ. So as Jesus Christ came personally to minister to patriarchs and prophets, we can see that it was God the Father working to and through Jesus Christ to minister to his people. So Christ as the Son was spirit, just as his Father is spirit. This is how the incarnation is so miraculous, that a spirit can put on human flesh. It is just as miraculous that a human man or a person can clothe divinity in his humanity. And so that's why 1 Timothy chapter 3.16 is so profound. Notice what it says. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Notice what it says. God, God in spirit, was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. And that would be Christ justified in the spirit of his Father, according to John chapter 14, verse 10. He was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. I think, just as much as Paul could say, this racks my brain. That God was manifest in the flesh. Well, so what's the big deal if he was in the flesh? If he was already in the flesh before. No, he was in spirit. So the Father and the Son, little short of being identical, were in the spirit. Okay, or were spirit. So Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. All of what I had said is, is preparing us for this verse right here. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So notice what's being said here. It says that, who is the one that gathered the wind in his fists? Okay, so I have some questions. What does the other versions or portions of the Bible translate when they use the word fists and when they use the word winds, okay, or wind? So I want to look at that for a moment. Notice what the Bible says about the, um, the hands or the, the, the fists. Same word, you just go ahead and look up that word in the original uh, language. Do that. I do that with my computer. It's quite simple. Right click and you search. So Exodus chapter 9 verse 8, notice what it says. The Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, 
and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. Handfuls. So I don't think God was saying, take handfuls, fists, and throw them you know, up in the air there. But what, what was happening is, take handfuls, take enough of the ashes to sprinkle there in front of Pharaoh. And uh, I think that's, that was, I mean, it makes better sense that they would take full handfuls of this stuff rather than fistfuls. And so notice Leviticus chapter 16, verse 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands, there's that word, full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Now we're talking about the Day of Atonement here. This is one of the most holy and solemn times in Old Testament history. God was asking a human to come into the presence of the most holy place, where what we call the Shekinah glory was there between the cherubim, as you can read in chapter 80, verse 1 of Psalms. And so here it says that, tell him to take in his hands, make them full of sweet incense, beaten small. So he's not going to go in there with these little fists of incense. I mean, if I were going in before the presence of God and he had asked me to fill my hands with incense, I'm going to be taking as much as I can in my hands. Okay, handfuls, right? So it's not fists. I don't know why in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4, they translated it fists. But notice Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands, there's that word, full with travail and vexation of spirit. So better is a handful, a little tiny handful, or one hand, with quietness, than both the hands filled with travail and vexation. So better to have little with good than a lot with, with you know, trouble. So the handfuls is what we're talking about, something that's referring to a lot. Ezekiel 10, verse 2. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub and fill thine hand, that's the word hand, with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight." So you'll, you'll have to notice the context. This is Ezekiel 10. This is right after chapter 9, where the angels, the six angels, were supposed to go in and slay those that were not weeping and sighing after the abominations that were done in the land. And they were to put a mark on those that were sighing and crying after those abominations, asking God to take care of the situation that is in his own city here on the earth. And so, right after that, take handfuls and scatter them over the city. So don't just take a little bit in one fist. Grab a bunch and scatter it as the, the judgments of God. Notice verse 7 of that same chapter is equal 10. One cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof, and put it into the hands, there's that word, of him that was clothed with linen. And he took it and went out. So when it says in Proverbs 30 verse 4, who has gathered the wind in his fists? I don't think it's talking about these clenched fists with a little bit of wind. I think it's talking about handfuls. So there's one aspect of this verse that I think I'd like to look at today. Notice as we read it again, we're going to see something else that's, I think, fascinating. Who hath ascended into the heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? That word wind? Okay, so let's look at the very first time that word is translated. It's translated in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the wind of God moved upon the face of the waters. The exact same word for wind in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4 is the same exact word here in Genesis 1 verse 2 that is translated spirit. So why in the world would Proverbs 30 verse 4 say that in his fists he gathered the wind? Okay. Well, why not in his hands he took up the Spirit? 
Well, let's think about this for a second. If it's talking about, in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, about what is his son's name, if thou canst tell. What is his name? What is his son's name? We're talking about the father, and he has a son. And so if his son originally was spirit, just as his father was, remember they are two a little short of being identical. If the father is spirit and he brings forth a son little short of being identical to himself, then wouldn't it make sense when Proverbs chapter 8 verse 30 says, Then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So if Proverbs 8 verse 30 said, talks about this young son being brought up, just as Jesus was brought up on the earth, remember? He grew in stature and in uh, favor with men, with God, and in wisdom. If Jesus Christ, before he came to this earth, was brought up as one with the Father, just as he was brought up in the human flesh when he was on the earth, then sure, the Bible makes it clear that in Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse 4, he was the spirit that was held in the hands of the Father. I see no reason why it shouldn't be translated this way, except that the enemy has been doing all that he can, if you even look on the internet <laughs> at this verse trying to find out what people have said about it. They're trying to say, yeah, people are trying to say that this refers to the Father and the Son, but yeah, maybe, mm, yeah, they're just going him hawing around. But you know what I think? I think it makes it pretty clear when we're reading letter 42, written in 1910 when it says this, Angels were expelled from heaven because they would not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves, and they forgot that their beauty of person and character came from the Lord Jesus. Notice what it says. This fact, this fact, the angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God. And they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. One angel began the controversy and carried it until, carried it on until there was rebellion in the heavenly courts among the angels. They were lifted up because of their beauty. So when looking at Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4 and seeing wind in his fists, why not, when the very verse talks about what is his name and what is his son's name, why not think about it as the spirit in his hands? See, if Adam and Eve reflect the father and the son, and Eve, the son, was brought forth from the side of Adam, or the son was brought forth from the side of the father, why not look at the father and the son just after Christ was begotten? Okay, sure, maybe he was uh, in full stature, but then maybe not. What does the eighth volume of the Testimonies, page 268.3, say? God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To him has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with his Father. I believe Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4 is talking about God the Father and his son.